quoting is an essential element in journalistic writing, and this Petsakutsa presentation is about a particular kind of quoting, which is very common, but at the same time very rarely discussed in research or in newsroom policies or journalism education. Actually, so far, this phenomenon hasn't even had a name, but now it has. It's translingual quoting. Quoting that contains a translational aspect. In other words, such quoting, where the original discourse on which the quote is based, is translated during the process of quoting. Okay, what's translingual quoting in practice? Here we have an example from a Swiss television program called Dele Journal. It deals with a demonstration in Beirut, and here you can see screenshots from the item. The item also consists of two quotes, and the quote we are focusing on now is by a female demonstrator. Originally, the demonstrator spoke Arabic, but in this item her statement is translingually quoted and thus presented with a French voiceover, like this. Nous voulons la culture, l'éducation, les moyens de transport, pas les armes. Nous désirons apprendre, progresser et mener une vie normale comme tout le monde. Before we take a closer look at this example, let's have first a broader view on the phenomenon at hand. Based on both theoretical and practical insight, it's apparent that there are two types of translingual quoting. Let's call them TQ1 and TQ2. And these two types differ depending especially on the context in which they take place. TQ1 refers to a process where ready-made media items are translated into another language as a whole. For example, in different language editions, or when one media agent exploits foreign newspapers or magazines by citing their content in another language. One typical TQ1 occurrence is when multinational news agencies produce interview material and then distribute it to national broadcasting companies, and these companies adapt the material and combine it with other raw material from their own information gathering. TQ2 there, both the interview for and the writing of a media item is conducted by a single journalist, but in different languages. TQ2 is commonplace for foreign reporters who work in remote areas, at least linguistically remote areas. However, it's commonplace also locally. For example, when a journalist interviews an immigrant, one of them or both of them might not be speaking their native language. And this asymmetry of language skills is likely to have an influence on the process of translingual quoting. And when it comes to local, we can also speak of immersive translinguality. What I mean by this is that translinguality is a permanent feature in minority language newsrooms. There, journalists must regularly interview people in the main language, and then translate it. Now, you might ask, so what? First, the news flows, as well as newsroom workflows, are getting more and more international. And the real key in answering this question is the fact that often TQ is conducted by journalists themselves, although they do not have professional education to do so. Let's go back to the demonstration example. With the video material, the journalist received a ready-made English translation of the original interview. And that was good because he doesn't speak Arabic. In a retrospective verbalization, he acknowledged that translations are always adaptions. And furthermore, because he has no Arabic, he has to rely on the ready-made English transcript, leading to a more approximate result. Okay, let's see how the quoting process actually proceeded. Above, there is the English translation 
of the original Arabic statement. This was what the journalist got with the video. Below there is the final version which he wrote and which was finally recorded as voiceover. Now let's focus on one particular issue. Most likely the phrase streets and tires, which was a literal translation of the original Arabic, refers to the habit of burning tires in the streets during riots so as to produce dense smoke. However, the journalist interpreted this linguistic cue as though it referred to public transportation and formulated his translingual quote accordingly. So, based on this analysis and a number of similar case studies, I could say that first, journalists mostly translate quotes by themselves, and their decision to do so is often only based on their personal assessment of their own proficiency. Two, then, typically, there are nobody in the production process to notice if some mistakes take place during translingual quoting. Three, decisions relating to translingual quoting are often made on an ad hoc basis and therefore the current practice is vulnerable to mistakes. Building on these three points, I want to wrap up this Pechukucha by quoting myself. To sum up, further developing the typology of translingual quoting on the one hand and identifying the enabling factors and constraints of the contexts in which these types of tikus take place on the other hand helps theory to better understand this phenomenon and practitioners to develop good practices and deal with critical issues. Furthermore, the powerful gatekeeping function that journalists perform in modern societies combined with the fact that readers are more likely to trust in and realign their own views with directly quoted ideas than with paraphrased ones extends the scope of influence of the translingual quoting phenomenon far beyond the walls of the newsrooms. That's it.